give our attention to our speaker. This is Mary Shai. Okay, let's give the projector a minute to warm up. Thanks so much, Matthew. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mary Shai. I am currently a PhD student in sociology at UC Berkeley, uh, but I've also been working with the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project since 2015 in a variety of roles and projects. So I'm here. I'm super excited to be here today to give you kind of a brief introduction to the work that the Mapping Project does, which we kind of think of in the broad framework of um, stories and data for resisting displacement. So that's also kind of like what I've titled the talk. Um, and we're like super happy to be here at Sonoma State University and thank you so much Brooke, for having us. Um, so uh, you'll see at the bottom of the slide that originally we were also going to have two speakers, me and Savannah Kilner. Savannah couldn't be here today because of, mostly because actually of this fire that we've all been feeling the impacts of. Um, so I also want to acknowledge that and acknowledge that um, there's space in this presentation for their views which we're unfortunately not going to be able to hear, but I'm going to try to do justice to the entire presentation we have planned to have. Um, so what are we going to, what am I going to be talking about in our kind of like half an hour or so together? I'm going to give us a, I'm going to give a brief kind of like blurby version of like who we are to give you a framework to think about, think about us through. I'm going to talk briefly about our history and methods, so kind of the origin of the, pro the project, how we do the work we do, and why we do it the way we do. And I think that's really where you're going to see kind of how our like feminist, post-colonial, decolonial perspective comes through. But I'm going to try to kind of take that jargon and show how, show you how we you know enact those principles. Then I'm going to talk a little bit of about our ongoing work because we always have something kind of in process. So it's always exciting kind of talk about what's ongoing and dynamic. And this is also the project that I've been spending a lot of time and energy on. So I feel most uh, able to speak about it. Which is counterpoints. It's our ongoing atlas project of the Bay Area. So it's actually an in-print book. So we have like an online version of our work and also kind of in-person versions. And then we're going to try to like keep about 10 minutes for a Q&A. Uh, so who we are. The Anti-Eviction Mapping Project is a collective of activists, scholars, and artists who use data analysis, data visualization, and multimedia storytelling to fight for spatial justice in the Bay Area and beyond. Um, I want to clarify that like we are like a super horizontal collective. We're also all volunteer run, and we don't necessarily we don't really operate from within a single institution. Like for example, I'm from UC Berkeley, but this isn't like a Berkeley project, right? The mapping project started through the San Francisco Tenants Union, but this is an SFTU project, etc. Um, I I want to kind of bring this up front because I also want to acknowledge kind of like the gap that um, you're seeing up here which is uh, because we're a collective project, like part of, the, part of the ways that we bring in as many different voices as possible is literally just to invite people from different communities to use our platform to share their stories. So normally when we give a presentation or we kind of present our work publicly, we actually have like a panel of people who are like, let me speak about the work that I'm doing, let me speak about the community that I'm representing. Um, and so I just kind of want to acknowledge, like right now, you're hearing kind of about the mapping project through a little bit more of my academic lens. <coughs> but I think part of the strength of the project is that normally you can also see it through a more activist lens, a more community-based lens, et cetera, right? Um, and Savannah was going to kind of help with that. Um, while uh, I'm also putting our kind of URL up here, because um, this is really where we're going to kind of find the most complete archive of our work. So after the lecture, if you want to like kind of explore what we're up to, that's where you can look. Um, briefly on the history and methods of the mapping project. So the anti-eviction mapping project started in 2013 as kind of a response to the tech boom that was hitting the Bay Area starting in 2011. 
as new kind of like tech money, new tech employees um, started flooding the Bay Area, the anti-eviction mapping project's original founders noticed that the representations that were kind of circulating in the Bay Area about the Bay Area were, no, were not really representing the communities that were actually already there, right? So for example, like an example of, um, and at the same time that you know, new tech money and new tech workers were flooding in, a lot of communities, a, long, a lot of long established communities in San Francisco were experiencing displacement. So the narratives that were circulating about San Francisco were centering these kind of like new forms of capital, new forms of labor, instead of centering the people who were ex experiencing displacement most centrally. So mostly Latinx, black and brown communities, poorer communities, renter communities. And kind of on like the slides right here, you'll kind of see an example of what I mean by um, the dominant narratives that were not centering these experiences of displacement. So for example, Jennifer Rosdale uh, published in kind of like this like real estate blog, like, hey, like, let's think about this part of San Francisco, which is the mission, not as the mission, as a Latinx working community, working class community, but instead of as the quad, like a part of San Francisco where single family homes could sell for three point, I think it's $3.5 million each, right? So we're kind of seeing this kind of disjuncture between dominant representations and representations that mapping project members were seeing on the ground. Um, based on, as a response to those maps, early anti-eviction mapping project members decided to try to produce counter maps. So this is actually the very first uh, map that the anti-eviction mapping project made. Um, members of what would become the mapping project and activists through the San Francisco Tenants Union said, what if instead of centering like real estate developers' perspectives, we centered stories of displacement? So the San Francisco Tenants Union and early AMP members went to the San Francisco Rent Board and asked for data on uh, Ellis Act evictions and produced this online interactive map. So this is just a screenshot. That if you were on the online version, when you hit play, what you see is the kind of like the blank map of San Francisco slowly become populated with these exploding dots, red and black dots, um, marking where there were Ellis Act evictions in San Francisco. And the size of the dots scales to the number of households that were being evicted. So it was kind of through uh, representations like this that the mapping projects tried to create a counter map for the types of dominant representations that they were seeing in the Bay Area. And at the same time, the idea was like, this isn't just kind of like a cool visual strategy. This is also creating data for, peop for people who are fighting displacement on the ground to resist their own displacement. So for example, by asking the San Francisco Rent Board for this Ellis Act eviction data, uh, the anti-eviction mapping project was able to demonstrate that Ellis Act evictions, which are evictions that occur which are a no-fault eviction, which occur when a tenant is evicted according to no fault of their own, had more than doubled between 2011 and 2013. Um, while the mapping project was starting to produce a lot of online visualizations, they kind of realized like, okay, like what we're doing online needs to be paired with something on the ground. So the anti-eviction mapping project partnered with Eviction Free San Francisco to take what they were doing offline onto, into the streets through things like this kind of like viral stenciling campaign in Mission, and also through direct actions like rent strikes and protesting serial evictors within San Francisco proper. So this is all kind of like 2013 still. In 2015, the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project launched its storytelling side, which we call uh, Narratives of Displacement and Resistance. And the storytelling side uses oral history techniques to um, both amplify these, the individual experiences of people who are, are experiencing di displacement, as well as kind of analyze them within a broader structural context. Because when you're experiencing displacement, it feels very isolating, and it feels like it's just something that you personally are experiencing. But when you see your eviction story put in conversation with your neighbor's eviction stories, with people in Oakland, Alameda, et cetera's eviction stories, all of a sudden you start to see kind of the structural regional contours of this problem, right? So the anti-eviction mapping project uses oral histories, which are like anywhere between normally 30 minutes to two hours in length, um, to allow people to not just tell their kind of eviction story, but give a more holistic kind of capturing of what home and place mean to them. And then the anti-eviction mapping project tries to seed narrative power and places that entire story online 
into its oral online oral history map, which co-locates the oral histories we do, so that's the dots in blue, with uh, eviction data that we've collected. Or in, uh, outside of San Francisco, you're also looking at foreclosure data. So this was also a way for us to kind of like counter what we were seeing as like a very, the very data driven side of our projects, right? Like just counting evictions, just counting um, uh, rising rental prices wasn't enough to tell the whole story. We also needed this side, this technique, this method. Um, there was also kind of in 2015 an offline component to our online oral history map. Uh, in 2015 we collaborated um, to create this uh, mural in Clarion Alley in San Francisco, which you can kind of see is like an analog depiction of our online map. And as you've kind of seen so far, like a lot of our online visualizations, um, they're interactive, they're moving. Um, so is this online oral history map, because you can kind of click around and, you know, like select a blue dot, and then this narrative comes up. Uh, just like that, our oral history map in Clarion Alley is also interactive it, with that mural, there's actually a number on the, painted on the wall, and you can call the wall, and then actually hear some oral histories from our oral history map. So this was another um, attempt for us to take what we were doing online and kind of make that real and put that into conversation with what was happening in communities. Since 2013, 2015, um, the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project has gone on to produce, I think, more than 115 oral histories. Um, partner with community organizations like Tenants Together and the Eviction Defense Collaborative in San Mateo Legal Aid to, to um, write more than 11 reports. Um, we, we've also self-published a zine, so the reports are kind of like the Alameda County Eviction Report up there. We've published a zine of our oral histories, we are here. We also have a lot of kind of like online tools uh, to help people kind of grapple with and think through and analyze the housing displacement crisis in the San Francisco Bay Area. So for example, we have this take a stand boycott form where you can look up whether the address that you live in or you're considering to live in has had a no-fault eviction in the past and then boycott that property or the landlords. Um, and we've also done a lot of like different storytelling, um, kind of multimedia storytelling collaboratives. So for example, uh, we collaborated with the Lay Atlas to produce these wall projections in downtown Oakland where we um, projected parts of our oral histories in a really public and visible way to kind of reclaim space for these narratives. So that's just kind of like a brief tasting of what we've done very broadly. In 2017, so the mapping project clearly started in San Francisco and very quickly we kind of moved from just San Francisco and took a more regional focus looking at Alameda County, San Mateo, Santa Cruz, et cetera. Um, but in 2017, we were actually able to also create New York and Los Angeles anti-eviction mapping project chapters. So here I'm just going to highlight kind of like two things that those chapters are really actively working on. On the top, the New York chapter just launched its serial evictors map and its own eviction mapping project, uh, eviction map, um, which is like super exciting. So it kind of, again, allows people to see on an individual level, right? Like where is displacement happening and who is driving on an individual level as opposed to this like abstracted level. And then in LA, um, the Los Angeles chapter has been working on this tenants in common uh, project which is like partnering with really cool kind of like radio and podcast producers and pro professional photographers to kind of like take our oral histories to the next level by producing also these like beautiful, for example, like portraits of people who are sharing their eviction stories and then using those um, to fight against displacement and particularly to fight for rent control in unincorporated areas of Los Angeles County. So, so yeah. So that was kind of like a really broad overview of just like our history, where, we, where we've come from, and kind of like a sampling of some of the stuff that we've done. Um, in terms of key themes that I think emerges from like this process, um, kind of our evolving process, is counter mapping, storytelling to build community power, deep collaborations with community-based organizations, like those reports I was talking to, as well as community-based organizations through which we learn about people who are experiencing displacement and organize with people to fight against their evictions. Um, we've also worked with a lot of classrooms at the 
we have one elementary school collaboration and then like a handful of high school and university like undergraduate level collaborations. Um, yeah, and we use those to bring in as many different perspectives as we possibly can into our analyses. Um, and our horizontal collective, which because we have like very fluid borders and boundaries and we're really committed to kind of training anyone that wants to be involved in our process, um, has also been like a really amazing source of energy, new ideas, collaborations, perspectives. Um, so those are our methods in terms of our guiding principles. Uh, we really see ourselves as a community-based archive that's creating shared authority with the people whose stories that we're telling. So we're not going in and extracting the story. We don't just want the sound clip. We want to give, we want to empower people to tell as holistic, as a humane, as a complex <laughs> and multiple story as possible and have people walk away feeling that they've been empowered to do that um, or just have their stories amplified. We see that, um, it's, we see that especially, I would say, for people who are more on the scholarly side. Um, we see that, we see our role as like redistributing epistemic privilege to people who've been told, like the way that you're telling that story doesn't make sense to us. That's irrational, that's an anecdote, et cetera, by placing individual stories in broader data context, placing individual stories in broader oral history context, things like that. Um, we also really think about our work as privileging knowledge from subjugated positions, right? So asking this kind of question of like, how is Jennifer Rosdale's analysis of the mission as the quad not even like one-tenth of the full story, right? Like when you start to ask people from different positions, how do you start to understand a situation better, more fully, right? Um, so from that perspective, we're really interested in centering indigenous, black and brown voices, people who are most marginalized. Um, as an analytical commitment. And we also are always aiming for open access work and interactive work, right? So everything that we do, we put online, um, available free of charge. It's not like an academic paper, right? Um, our, report, our reports as well. And to the greatest extent possible, we try to make everything interactive. So yeah, I'm gonna pause real quick and just like ask if there are any quick questions before I move on. Yeah. Is there, um, do you do follow-up with the folks who have been displaced? Mm -hmm. And is there data on like homelessness in those that's, stories, or are those part of these stories? That's a really great question. So one um, of our community reports uh, with the Eviction Defense Collaborative, um, it's a series of reports now. I think the first one was in 2015. We looked at people who went through the Eviction Defense, Defense Collaborative, which is a legal aid clinic for people who are, who are facing eviction, and we followed up with them when we asked them, um, where were you after being evicted, right? And actually, that analysis, is, so that analysis is available in that report, and it's also available in our atlas. Um, so that's maybe like a good segue into our app into talking about one of our ongoing projects, which is CounterPoints, our app. So in late 2016, early 2017, um, people in the anti-eviction mapping project started asking themselves, like, we have this amazing archive of work, but it's all online. And we were starting to kind of see, so, so there was that, and we were also starting to see the complexity of kind of displacement in the Bay Area, and we saw that we were, all, we were always looking at like one little slice of it through whatever project we were working on. So as kind of a response to these two things, we thought, what if we took our online work and our industry work and we try to translate some of that into an analog atlas to increase accessibility to our work, but at the same time also used an atlas as an opportunity to kind of reflect on what we had been learning and take a more structural regional view analysis of what was going on in the Bay Area. But at the same time, we didn't want to kind of produce something that was like, this is the anti-eviction mapping project's take on X, Y, or Z, because we had started, we had seen how complex thinking about space, place, home, displacement in the Bay Area was. So we weren't thinking about the Atlas so much as like, this is the mapping project, take it or leave it, we also wanted to create a platform for people who are doing similar work to have their analyses broadcast, right? So that was kind of like the original impulses behind thinking about like why we would want to do a print atlas to begin with. Once we kind of had that idea, we um, circulated a call for papers or a ra rather a call for proposals 
within our broader network. So not just like anti-eviction mapping people, but artists, we had been working with community-based organizations, we had worked with different um, legal clinics, policy, advocacy organizations, other scholars, et cetera. And we said essentially like, the anti-eviction mapping project is working on this book, but we also want to be a platform for you to have your most radical work shown, right? Like anything that maybe didn't fit into a policy context, an academic context, wasn't exactly in your wheelhouse artistically, we want to have, we want to be able to create a platform for that kind of work. So we circulated this around with our networks. We got um, a few dozen applications for uh, proposals. And at the same time, we were kind of going through the mapping project's work and asking what of our existing work would we want to put into an atlas? What are the gaps in our analyses? What do we need to make to fill that kind of stuff in? Based on this process, um, we took external contributors and internal work, as well as kind of our internal wish list for new work, and decided on producing an atlas with seven chapters that we thought really captured the big themes, could capture the big themes that we saw as necessary to <coughs> kind of sitting with understanding, sitting with the complexity of displacement in the Bay Area. So there are evictions and root shock, indigenous geographies resistance, health and environmental racism, gentrification and state violence, um, infrastructure and transportation, migrations, relocations, speculation and speculative futures, uh, and kind of like a little bit of a hopeful epilogue. So, so the atlas that emerged has seven thematic chapters, and each thematic chapter is helmed by kind of between one and three kind of like point people within the atlas, but is also, sorry, within the mapping project, but is also really just kind of a collaborative um, thing, thing that we've all been working on. Um, and each chapter also has, in addition to kind of like the substantive analyses, um, oral histories and uh, examples of resistance, so kind of like community-based um, rent strikes or community benefit agreements, things like that, as well as like analyses of the policy basis behind displacement in each. Um, yeah. So, can we keep it just for a second? Okay, cool. Um, Savannah, who's originally going to be joining me, um, she was one of the lead editors for the Indigenous Geographies of Resistance chapter, and I was one of the lead editors for Migrations Relocations. So um, I'm going to speak really briefly about the Indigenous Geographies of Resistance chapter. I don't want to like do it violence, but I can kind of preview it and then speak a little bit more about the Migrations Relocations chapters and kind of give you a sense of what I mean when I say it's like this is a really open atlas with a lot of different types of contributions, um, and how does it speak with multiple voices, how does it take a more regional, historical, structural approach, et cetera, um, and then open it up for Q&A. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like what remains. Uh, can I move on from this slide? So, okay, Indigenous Geographies of Resistance is a really, really cool chapter. It takes both, it kind of, it has kind of two, I would say you kind of think about it in doing two things. So one thing it does is it kind of recovers the deep history of colonial dis dispossession in the Bay Area by doing things, but for example, of kind of like re-envisioning and remapping and representing the Bay Area according to origin original indigenous names for lands as opposed to like the names that they have today, right? Like that's kind of like, it has a few versions of these kind of maps. And it also does really cool things like, like it has an amazing essay with some um, really cool photographs from archives about um, this, this program where people, where indigenous women who were being essentially held captive in missions were also being sent into upper middle class white homes throughout the Bay Area um, as part of a, like a domestication program for these indigenous women to learn what does it mean to run, to live in kind of like a white household, right? Like this intimacy was supposed to kind of create assimilation, but at the same time it was enrolling indigenous women into this kind of domestic, exploitative domestic labor relationship with white settler, white settlers in the Bay Area. So there's kind of a historical component to this chapter, but there's also a very contemporaneous moment where it kind of asks like more hopefully like what are active movements towards decolonizing, reclaiming land in the Bay Area for indigenous communities. So I understand that Kerna Gold has already come and spoken to you in this lecture series 
Um, some of the work that she does with the Segorite Land Trust is also highlighted in our atlas, which is like super, super exciting. Um, and Savannah Kilner and Maggie Ramirez, who was her co-editor for this chapter, was also shadowing a lot of kind of like ongoing um, indigenous organizing in the Bay Area, like Bates, which is, there's a photo from their annual meeting up above. Um, or for example, Canyon Saviors, Roods, Ohlone Protocols for organizing. So this is like really, really cool and super sad that Savannah couldn't be here to like speak more in depth and more powerfully about this. So I really want to highlight um, some of the work that they've been doing with the Indigenous Geographies chapters because, I mean, it's, the whole atlas is amazing, but this is so important. In terms of migrations, relocations, um, this was an exciting chapter for me to work on, partly because I actually grew up on the fringes of the Bay Area. And one reason, so I grew up in Tracy. I don't know if anyone knows where Tracy is. Yeah, everyone's kind of also smiling because it's like the kind of place that if you're a local, you like kind of know what Tracy is and you kind of know maybe a little bit about like how it fits into the Bay Area. But if you just read about the Bay Area and the news, you would never know that like Tracy really exists, right? So it's really exciting for me to kind of think like what, to, to ask this question of like what, um, what does it mean to take a regional perspective that looks beyond just like San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose. Um, my, the Migrations Relocations chapter is organized, I would say, um, kind of at three levels. So some of it is at this like super high structural level, which is just like we look at census data and we look at how um, where people live in the Bay Area has shifted over time. So like I have an example of that on slide two. So for example, here, if you compare census data from 1970 to 2016, you see that the share of population that lives in the suburbs has just completely ballooned, right? And that's kind of what you see on the left by the relative sizes of the little circles, each one which represents a municipality in the greater Bay Area. But at the same time, you also see, um, by just looking at this really abstracted level, how there's kind of been a depopulation of the Bay Area's more like inner city urbanized areas. So on the right, you see um, growth compared to the average regional growth, where red means more growth and kind of like lighter, 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 to white means like zero growth. And you see that there's like, again, kind of a ballooning of population in suburban areas, but not really in these more inner areas. So these kind of like taking this like really high level look, kind of, um, we saw it, the people who were organizing this chapter as a, as a first stab at trying to understand how population in the Bay Area has shifted broadly and how that has created the conditions for gentrification, long commutes, um, the housing crisis that we see in the Bay Area today. But like I said, this is like an ongoing theme by now, we know that like this really broad data-driven view, it doesn't tell the whole story. Um, sorry, before I move on to the middle level of the story, another cool, thi another, like, cool data-driven map that we have is a map that shows um, the percentage of each municipality by their percent uh, foreign born. There are a lot of cities in the greater Bay Area where it's like more than 50% of the population was actually not born in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so we use that kind of spread as a way to center immigrant communities in the Bay Area and we break down some of those municipalities by like where are the countries of origin of these, pe of these communities. And that's gonna kind of become relevant in a second, you'll see. But yeah, so like this top layer data-driven approach like never tells the whole story. So we also have um, contributions like Rashid Shabazz's timeline, which you see running across the bottom, which is a kind of more middle level approach where Rashid takes his own family's experience, individual experience of eviction from the city of Alameda. He is a black man whose family has lived in Alameda for three generations now, or had lived in Alameda for three generations. And he puts that in conversation with the broader kind of like policy level history of black exclusion in the Bay Area. So he looks at racial covenants and subdivisions <laughs> within the city of Alameda. He looks at Measure A, which was like a very kind of like, um, it, rest it restricted development within Alameda to a very certain group of people <laughs> without ever naming what that certain group of people was. Um, so it essentially drove out a lot of the black community in Alameda in the 80s. Um, he looks at Measure M1, et cetera. So looking at this kind of like middle policy level to ask how his family's individual experience of forced migration, forced relocation, intersects with this middle level of policy. And we have a few um, 
stories kind of in this vein. And then we pair this, this chapter also pairs this work with individual level stories of migration and relocation. So for example, we have a uh, con contribution from a collective of artists who were displaced from a collective home in San Francisco. Um, and as a result, had dis, uh, decided that they were going to create a new collective home, but the only place that they could afford to do that was in East Oakland, in the Fruitvale neighborhood of East Oakland. So it was a group of um, college-educated, mostly white, mostly young, mostly childless artists who were really sensitive to kind of like, what does it mean to be displaced? They had been displaced, right? What, is it, what does neighborhood change mean collectively? And how, is that, how can that be harmful to communities that are experiencing it? But at the same time, found themselves in the complex relationship of being a displacer <laughs> to this new East Oakland community, or rather kind of like a first wave gentrifier. So we also use, in addition to like the big data, meso policy level analyses, we also have these kind of like individual level stories, right? Of how people are kind of circulating through the Bay Area and how it's creating these new relationships. And what does that really mean? Um, and as you kind of can see, each of these contributions, the editors, we edit them for clarity and length, but it was a very collaborative process. And it was always about like, how do you say what you're trying to say more clearly? Not so much like, how can you say something that's in line with what the, what the mapping project says, right? So each of these chapters is really a collection of all these different voices and thinking about the Bay Area for each theme. And for this particular chapter, we also end with a really cool kind of like series of like mini blurbs highlighting the work that um, different community-based organizations have been doing to fight displacement, not in San Francisco, Oakland, et cetera, but like in the suburbs, <laughs> right? So thinking about like what resistance means in, like in non-central cities, but also in particular in the Bay Area, how the cultural diversity, the racial ethnic diversity of the Bay Area feeds into that. So, um, for example, Fremont Rise, like all of their organizing spaces were like churches and mosques. And it was, they were a community, um, Fremont Rise um, was a collaboration really between like Filipino and uh, the Afghani community in, Fre in Fremont. Um, and yeah, and thinking about like how exactly um, can we hold both like the cultural diversity of the suburbs, which isn't even really a like a, the dominant narrative of the suburbs, with um, thinking about urban protest, which is also not really seen as like a very suburban thing, right? So you mm -hmm. just a couple more minutes if you want to have yeah. Any questions, right? um, yeah. So that's kind of chapter six. Um, the Atlas, as you can kind of like already sense, was like a really big sprawling project. We started this in late 2016. That call for papers um, went out in 2018. And um, we've been working with like a long, 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 long list. I actually haven't enumerated it of like external collaborators uh, to put together the Atlas as a whole. So I just kind of wanted to um, end with like an acknowledgement of like all the people who've been playing lead roles <laughs> in the Atlas, which I think kind of begins to illustrate the complexity and kind of the collective nature of this process. But this isn't even like, this isn't even a list of all of our collaborators. Um, so this is like super exciting. This is in the works. Right now we have the content of the Atlas pretty much like set and we have a manuscript and we have all our photos and illustrations and analyses and it's all amazing. Um, right now where we are is we're learning how much work it takes to publish a book. <laughs> so we are in a layout process um, with our designer. We're finalizing a cover. I was hoping to tease a cover for you guys, but it's literally in process right now. Um, look out for this. This is going to be, we have a publisher, PM Press, which is an independent publisher out of Oakland. And hopefully um, the plan is to have the Atlas available fall 2020. And while we're kind of working on the publishing side, we are also creating a free online supplement um, for kind of like additional collaborations and contributions that didn't make it into the print atlas. Um, a free online supplement for educators. So like I kind of mentioned, we've done a lot of classroom collaborations, but what, what could it look like for you to apply some of these methods or like apply just the lessons that we've garnered here um, into your classrooms, that kind of thing. And we're also working on a, it's not launched yet, but 
in the next six months, you'll also see like a fundraising campaign to keep the print atlas affordable because that's another thing, like access is so big for us. Um, and there's no way that you can print such a long, color rich book completely for free and then distribute it. But we're trying to keep this in like the $20 range instead of like the $40, $50 range, which is like what you see of a lot of kind of like large format color books. Um, so yeah, so it's ongoing work. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Question? Yeah. PM Press? Yeah. yeah. It seems, I mean, you all seem to be doing incredibly thought, like, well thought out, really interactive, detailed work. How, if you don't mind sharing with you, how are you all funded, or how do you, mm. how do you afford to do that work? That's a great question. So, we are completely a volunteer-run collective, and we also um, do not have like a formal incorporation status. Partly because like formal incorporation leads to kind of like certain legal roles and responsibilities that we are not interested in uh, obtaining. What we we kind of work, I would say, um, I would say maybe. This is just like a rough estimate. Sixty percent of our work is like, like truly, 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 just like, like volunteer run in the sense of like individuals volunteering to share their stories with us, individuals volunteering to contribute to our community power maps, individuals in the classroom collaborations that we work with, helping us transcribe our oral histories, um, reach out to their communities, stuff like that. The other. Um, 40% of the work, I would say, is kind of like, kind of see this, like there are like people who are more central to like the institutional core of the mapping project and kind of like holds kind of the administrative back end together. And we also do a lot of that work. Most of us are completely unpaid. <laughs> so that kind of addresses like how do we, like what kind of resources do we have? Um, in terms of like, you know, anyone who's done like this type of work, you know so much of the work is so much of the funding goes into staff, so we have very low staff costs. In terms of the resources we use for like hosting events, which like event space costs money, AV costs money, like these kind of things, producing our um, reports, things like that, we partner with community organizations to do that and community nonprofits. So we've gotten funding from the San Francisco Arts Commission, we've gotten funding from the Creative Work Fund, for example, those eviction defense collaborative reports, the eviction defense collaborative chipped in funding for, um, the 2016 Alameda report that we got funding from TENS together. We've gotten funding from UC Berkeley, partly to, with this atlas, and also UC Santa Cruz. Um, but yeah, so it's a mix of both kind of like more like traditional nonprofit-y things like San Francisco Arts Commission Creative Work Fund, as well as kind of like policy advocacy facing stuff together, eviction defense collaborative, as well as like academic side. But we're like a pretty lean organization. But we also see that as kind of like in the spirit of what we do. Um, and what I was talking about, like redistribution, that's also how we think of like, especially from my perspective as an academic, I see some of this work as redistributive, taking the money of the university <laughs> instead of using it to fund academic voices, fund voices from the community. Um, and we recognize like it's kind of like a precarious position and it's like, so I do quite a bit of administrative back work. Uh, it's like so much work and it can be exhausting to be like applying to these grants all the time. But the fact that we get them to us is a signal that like what we're doing resonates with people. And if we stop getting it, like that's, that's also a valid signal to us. Um, so yeah, so that's like the honest answer, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so how do you pick out people that you reach out to have their voices mm, That's a great question. Um, all right, so like I said, like the horizontal open collective, a lot of people come to us because they're already working in similar spaces and they kind of like enter the collective and we meet people through that. Um, that's like, that's been a really, that's been a key way. The other key way has been through things like San Francisco Tenants Union, uh, LACLA, which is the Los Angeles Community Legal Aid. 
Hmm. Anyway, I think that's what LACLA is in Los Angeles. Um, eviction defense collaborative. People who are like low income and facing eviction will often go to these kind of like legal aid clinics to get help fighting their eviction process, which is like a super complex and legalistic thing actually. And we have intake forums in those kind of spaces as well um, to identify people. Um, on our anti-eviction mapping project website, there's like a little form you can also fill in. Like if you see the work that we're doing and you want to have your story told, like we're all ears. So there's that. Um, and things like the Call the Wall, uh, Mural and Clarion Alley also has, you know, it's like you can also share your story, right? Like we, um, we have that there. And like whenever we do like a community listening event or a presentation, we make it, like we try to make it super clear. Like if you have a story to share, we're all ears. We're not selective. We really, we're not trying to judge like whose stories should be told. We're just trying to kind of like create a platform for as many stories to be told as possible. Um, can I ask you, and um, will, how have gender, sexuality, mm. or feminism come up or yeah. been addressed in any projects, or have they? That's like a super, super important question. Um, I was wondering how like didactic to make <laughs> that exactly in a way. I think it, it might be helpful for us to kind of understand yeah. th does that come in or how does that come in? Yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, so I'm, I'm bringing up the key theme slide again because so much of um, where this, th this project, like I said, has had its roots in the San Francisco Tenants Union but one of the key founders of the project, Aaron McElroy, um, they were also doing, like moving in and out of academia, um, anthropology, feminist studies, et cetera. And the stuff that they were getting from those spaces was really informing, like what does it mean to be a critical project to represent things in a critical way, right? And some stuff that they were looking at was really in like the post-colonial and feminist tradition where women and people from like non-metropole spaces from the colonies were saying like like when we look around we see analyses we see histories we see representations that completely exclude our experience and also devalue our experience and devalue our narrative and that has like analytical consequences because you can't see the full picture if you're not considering the view from below as well as the view from above right or even this question of like how is the view from below even better, richer, more whole, more honest than the view from above. Um, and also asking like what was going on, like how was silencing a power relation, right? Which I think is, I think those are themes that both like feminist and post-colonial scholars are really interested in. So I'm thinking like Haraway, Chakrabarty, Spivak, um, Harding. Um, does that kind of answer like the, I think we're like feminist post-colonial epistemologists in a way, is how we think about it academically. In terms of um, how this project has come to center like race and um, indigene indigeneity, colonial histories, things like that, um, I mean, that's, that to us comes from this whole like who gets to tell their stories and what does it mean to tell a more complete story from marginalized positions. So to us, it just feels like essential to <laughs> actually tell those stories. Otherwise, you can't get the whole picture of displacement in the Bay Area. And then we also do that from a more hopeful perspective, right? Like once you bring in these voices, what are visions of a shared collective future together? What, what emerges from that more whole community? Or even radically, right? Like what, like maybe there's a break that can happen and what, what would that look like? So in the Atlas, we have things, um, especially in, Speculation, speculative futures, right? Like in that chapter, there's a map illustrating uh, activity we did with elementary school students at uh, Guadalupe Elementary in San Francisco, where um, elementary school students were asked to do what we call community power mapping, which is like identify the places that give them strength in their communities, right? Kind of like give us a more autonomous narrative about their communities. And we illustrated those um, to the level of like, like students were saying, it's like, we live in communities where the streets are named after white men and we don't know who these people are. They're not the people that we feel connected to. Like, um, like I can't remember any specific, like I'm getting at the language wrong, but you know, it's like, what if we had like happy, warm feeling street or like um, a student was like um, talking about like how there's just like a lot of dog, dog poop in her like, like near her garage because like they have this kid, they have the dog and like just seeing that reminds them of like coming home, like, you know, just kind of like, like the, the authenticity and like the, 
non-self-awareness of children is so great. So it's like, what if we like had a map that like centered that kind of thing and like there was like dog poop avenue or something like this, right? As opposed to um, like, they were essentially named colonizers. Um, but yeah, so also like centering these voices, like what alternative futures can we imagine? That was like a more fanciful example, but we also have like community organizers who like write more concretely, <laughs> like, you know, it's like if we or reorganized Oakland to like center black artists, what would that look like? What would funding, what would public spending look like? What would the downtown look like? Things like that. We're gonna have to end it there, but thank you. Thank you.